downtown Las Vegas. In the shadows of the lustrous main strip, parts of it are a hot pot of crime and homelessness. The perfect spot for a would-be serial killer to satisfy his dark urges. And following a spate of attacks on homeless men, it would take an inventive plan to attempt to snare a murderer in action. Hello and welcome to the little shop of crime, curators and purveyors of all things macabre and mysterious. A lot of you have been asking for more fresh cases that you've never heard before, and I'm pretty confident most of you won't be familiar with the details of this one, outside of mainstream news coverage at least. But first, some quick shopkeeping. My name is Steve and I offer interesting true crime cases each week, usually solved but occasionally mysterious. And today's case is certainly unique as far as I can tell. I'd rather not give too much away, so let's just investigate. This is The Mannequin Murderer. Welcome to fabulous Las Vegas. Tens of millions throng to Sin City every year. No other city hosts more world-renowned shows than the self-proclaimed entertainment capital of the world. It's an oasis of neon in the dry Mojave Desert, and it's hard to think of a place where your eyes could be quite so busy. Whether you're craning your neck at the tapestry of lights on Fremont Street, the dancing Bellagio Fountains, or the 350 meter high views from the Strats, there are endless things to see and do. Cool, look at that view. And the scenery behind him ain't bad either. Famous for its themed hotels and casinos, Las Vegas is the perfect place to party, to enjoy artery shattering food venues and decadent buffets, or to flirt with Lady Luck. But there are many in Vegas who have run out of luck. Behind the dazzling lights and flashy veneer is a city plagued with homelessness and crime. Recently, Las Vegas was voted 7th in the list of cities for homeless rates, with 1 in 366 people living rough. With its shelters regularly at maximum capacity, more than 5,000 individuals sleep on its streets and in its sewers on any given night. Its crime rates aren't much more promising either. The city has a violent crime rate 36% higher than the national average. Put these together and you have a pretty dangerous place to live if you're one of the city's vagrants. And to make matters worse, they recently passed a controversial law making it illegal for homeless people to sleep on its streets, punishable by up to six months in prison and a $1,000 fine. I'm not sure how they came up with that. If a person had a spare $1,000, they're unlikely to be sleeping on the streets in the first place. One such homeless person was Daniel Aldape. Originally from Chicago, the 46-year-old man was a huge White Sox fan and heavy metal enthusiast. He'd been sleeping on the streets of Las Vegas for about four months, but he did keep in regular contact with his family, calling every couple of weeks. In case anyone is wondering, yeah, they did try to offer help, but he always refused. Daniel was familiar with this junction, City Parkway and Grand Central. It's an area often populated with homeless people at night, and this exact place was where he decided to rest his head on a cold night on January 3rd, 2017. But unbeknownst to Daniel, he would sadly never see another bright Vegas morning. Daniel was found dead on the morning of January 4th with devastating head trauma. He was still wrapped in his blanket, so it was evident he'd been killed while he slept. Because of his transient lifestyle, police were sadly unable to inform his family. In fact, 20 full days would pass before his sister called a Las Vegas morgue in desperation. Daniel was supposed to attend her wedding in June, but instead a memorial photo of him was placed in the program. The man who raised Daniel, Fred Shalk, said he was a good person. He wasn't a fighter. He would never hurt anybody. He was good. 
Police initially thought that his death likely stemmed from a feud with another member of the homeless community. Given the high crime rates and excessive homelessness, it's sad but likely true that the death of a homeless man didn't rank particularly high in the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department's priority list. That is until precisely one month later on February 3rd when another man was found dead with remarkably similar injuries. This piqued police interest. 60-year-old David Dunn was found with fatal head injuries near the same junction. He too had been killed in his sleep with a blunt object. A church memorial was held shortly after his death, at which Kit Muzarek, David's friend of 15 years, made a touching speech about how they first met in line at a McDonald's. Dave, with those crazy thick glasses, came up to me and said, Do you want something? He bought me a soda. I said, aren't you going to get something too? He said, I don't have any money. That was Dave. He would give his last penny to anyone. You got such polar opposites here. Dave, who didn't have anything except joy and giving, and you got the guy who did this. I mean, we all have to die, but the brutality of it, that's what's hard to accept. After the memorial, during mealtime at the homeless shelter where David regularly stayed, his friends shared stories about their lost pal. His usual chair sat empty, but for a bouquet of flowers and a single candle. Fear quickly spread amongst the homeless community in downtown Las Vegas. Police were already beginning to crack down on urban camping, and so the city's vagrants were afraid to sleep in groups, and now, following these brutal attacks, they were afraid to sleep alone too. Shelters were full, so there was nowhere safe to sleep. It didn't take long for police to establish that there was a likely connection between the two killings. At the same junction, in the dead of night, two people had been fatally attacked while they slept in precisely the same way. Neither David nor Daniel had been robbed, so police believed the attacks were what they described as thrill kills, murders for nothing but the macabre gratification of killing. Their attacks were also later linked to another similar attack that had happened months earlier on November 30th, when another sleeping man was struck over the head. He survived his injuries but didn't see the attacker. Autopsies conducted on David and Daniel concluded that the most likely weapon used to attack them was a hammer, but other than that, police had very little in the way of leads. No witnesses or CCTV, no DNA from the perpetrator and no weapons left behind. And they knew they had to act fast, the clock was against them, to catch the would-be serial killer before any other victim's lives were claimed. The case was assigned to police captain Andrew Walsh, who hatched an ingenious plan to use a lifelike CPR dummy as bait and to pose it as a sleeping homeless man in the hopes of catching the attacker in the act. A number of Andrew's colleagues thought the plan was ludicrous. Nothing like this had ever been done before, but without any leads, they had nothing to lose. The team watched how homeless men set up their camps in the area and copied it so that the dummy looked genuine. They nicknamed the mannequin Charlie McCarthy after a famous ventriloquist dummy with the same name who launched to fame in the 1930s. They dressed Charlie in a hooded sweatshirt, boots, a knitted hat and wrapped him in a floral print blanket and so the sting operation was underway. Cameras were installed at the intersection and human surveillance teams remained in position and every evening Charlie was posed to look like a man sleeping rough. Each morning, they'd collect him and repeat the process the following night. And eventually, on February 22nd, police watched a man pacing around a dark corner for almost 14 minutes, approaching the dummy three times before he, well, did this.
Police arrested 30-year-old Shane Schindler, originally from Michigan, on the spots, and he was taken in for questioning, charged with attempted murder. More homicide detectives. Okay. We're not interested in your warrants. We don't care about the dummy. That's not our, our business. All right. Okay. Um, we're actually working. There's There's been some homeless people who have been hurt. Okay. Um, that have gotten seriously hurt. Okay. And that's what we're investigating. Okay. Okay. And um, some homeless men have, have gotten hit with a hammer. Okay. And that's why we're interested in this. Okay. Okay, that's why we're talking to you. Right. Okay, have you hit anybody with a hammer? No. Okay. You, um, there are some guys in the past, what, I'll, what I'm thinking of doing is I'll grab the book and show you some pictures and see if you know anybody. Okay. Maybe we can figure out who gave you that hammer. Okay. Um, you have not hit anybody with a hammer before? No. Could you hit somebody with a hammer and not remember it? No. Okay. Why would you pick this point in time to hit that mannequin with a hammer? And um, we can actually show you everything you did. Right, right. Yeah. Well, like I said, it was kind of weird, you know, seeing okay. a mannequin. Did you actually wait down for a while? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was probably going to sleep there tonight, so... You thought about sleeping and just crashing right there. Yeah. But then you thought better of it and went back to the to the dummy. Uh, well, yeah, that was kind of strange. The dummy sitting there, so. Okay. How sure of you were were you that that was a dummy? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yes. You before you made contact with it. Yes. Those are made to look like humans. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. When you first hit it, were you sure it was a dummy? Yes. I don't know how. Well, like I said, it wasn't breathing, it wasn't moving. You know, I put stuff as ever sticking out. What if it was a human being that was just not moving? Well, you know, I was sure. Well, you're sure now. What, if, what I'm saying is, what if it turned out to be human? Would that have bothered you? Well, yeah, of course, but I knew it wasn't human. If it was human, I wouldn't have did it. The problem being is we've had some other people, people, struck in the head in the exact same fashion that you struck this dummy in the head. Okay. Um, that's that's something that we're uh, worried about. Okay. Okay? If you had something to do with that, if, if there's something going on with you, we need to know what's going on. There's nothing going on. This is the first incident I've ever had like this. And I knew it was a dummy, and if it was a real person, what never happened. So. Do you need help? I'm going over to Clark County. That's pretty much my biggest fear right now. <laughs> you're you're going to go to Clark County. That's I am? Yeah. Um, we're going to make sure the officer arrests you and takes you to jail. Why? Because you make us nervous. I do? Yeah, you do. You do. Why? Because I think you're I think you're out there killing people. I'm not killing nobody. I, I think you are. I thought I was going to walk out of here. Are you really going to have him arrest me? Yeah, you have a warrant. And I, I think you, you need to go over to the jail. Um, we're going to get a search warrant so I can get the DNA from you. Um, we're going to get a search warrant. We're going to take your clothing. Ryan told you when we sat down, we're going to be really upfront with you. And you also saw you walk out of here at any time. But I guess that you was... Could, you could stop the questioning anytime you want. Yeah. Uh, but things are changing as we go. The more we get to know you, the more you worry me. I do? Yeah, you do. <clears throat> I honestly honestly believe that you're going around hitting people in the head with a hammer and killing them. It's not me. While they're sleeping. It's not me. Okay. Who is that? I don't know. The whole reason we put that dummy out was to see who'd come along and hit it. You're the man. And you're the guy. Okay. It's the same spots where other people have been killed. Same position. 
that's how we knew where to put the dummy. Okay. <sighs> so I'm going to make it be in Clark County. So Shane was firmly standing by his I knew it was a dummy all along argument. He also stated in the interview that he thought it would be funny to kick the dummy and that he didn't remember hitting it with the hammer. Now there's the first evidence of a lie because as we saw in the surveillance footage he didn't kick the dummy at all. He suddenly violently struck it with the hammer with two hands in a manner that looked far more viciously motivated than playful. Not only that, but he also told police he slept on the streets and in parking lots every night without a bedroll, blanket or sleeping bag. But they were quick to notice that his clothes were spotless and his hands meticulously clean. Shane told police that he'd recently bought the hammer from another homeless man in the downtown area for $3. According to the police arrest report, when close enough to strike his victim, Schindler removed the hammer from the bag, then struck what he thought was a human being in the head with the hammer, with the intent to kill. The decoy mannequin was staged in a manner which would have made it impossible for Schindler to have determined the mannequin was not a human being before he struck. Schindler swung the hammer using both arms to generate maximum force to his blow. But Shane's defence attorney said, I've read the transcript and there's nothing to contradict what he told police, which was that he knew it was a mannequin. With no evidence linking Shane to the previous murders, and no proof that he thought the dummy was a living person, they'd reached a stalemate. It was his word against theirs. And so after a short stay in jail, police had no choice but to release Shane while the investigation continued. They set up a surveillance team who tracked him to the nearby Henderson Motel. In searching his room, they found a receipt for a hammer that had been returned to Harbour Freight. They also found his cell phone, on which was a selfie of Shane lying on his back in the street. Using the manhole cover behind, investigators amazingly were able to determine that the shot was taken close to where Daniel and David's bodies had been found. It apparently matched with one seen in the surveillance footage. This placed him in the area around the time of their deaths. And this is where things start to get a little philosophical. Shane's attorney argued that you cannot kill an inanimate object, and therefore you cannot charge a man with attempted murder if the victim was never alive to begin with. But police maintained that the intention is what's important here. And so Shane Schindler stuck with his story and pled not guilty to the attempted murder charge and a trial was set for August that year. Now this is where things start to get a little frustrating. Despite his lies, despite him attacking the dummy in the same way as David and Daniel were killed, and despite all of the other factors connecting Shane to the murders, without the proverbial smoking gun, the evidence was too circumstantial to charge him with their murders. But officers firmly believed he was their man, and they wanted him off the streets nonetheless. And so both the prosecution and Shane's attorney negotiated a deal that they believed would provide an appropriate resolution. A plea bargain. Police would agree not to file charges in relation to the murders, the attack on the third man, as well as a charge for carrying a concealed weapon. And Shane Schindler would admit to attempted murder, for which he would receive a sentence of 8 to 20 years. And on August 22nd, in court, he admitted to attacking the mannequin with the hammer under the assumption that it was, in fact, a real person. And he was formally sentenced to the 8 to 20 years. What that indeterminate sentence means is he must serve a minimum of eight, after which he'll be eligible for parole. If he isn't granted parole between the eight and twenty years, then he'll be set free after the twenty on mandatory release. Shortly before handing Shane the maximum sentence he could, District Judge Michael Villani said, These attacks are senseless. It boggles the mind. Okay, so that one is kind of solved, but there are definitely some loose ends. Justice for David and Daniel was ultimately never specifically provided, but a dangerous man was nonetheless taken off the streets of Las Vegas. The only real solace I find in this story is that both David and Daniel likely had no knowledge of their fate, since they were both sleeping at the time of the incidents. That doesn't make it any less tragic, but at least they were likely not suffering in their final moments. You have to hand it to Captain Andrew Walsh for coming up with such an inventive plan to capture the would-be serial killer. And I'm not saying Shane Schindler was guilty of their murders, of course, since he was never formally convicted of them. But they did stop after his arrest. 
thank you so much for watching another video here with me today. I don't really want to say enjoyed because that doesn't feel like the right word but if you appreciated this video please give it a quick like and I'll hopefully see you next week when I'll be back with a whole new case. Goodbye.